You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. This is the CRM Archaeology Podcast. It's the show where we pull back the veil of cultural resources management archaeology and discuss the issues that everyone is concerned about. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to the CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 274 for October 4th, 2023. I'm not your host, Chris Webster, but I'm recording the intro because nobody on the podcast did. On today's show, we talk about what makes a CRM project go wrong or a podcast. I don't know, probably just a project. So get ready to go in the field, then go right back home instead because this is CRM and the CRM Archaeology Podcast starts right now. Hello and welcome to the CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 274. It's crazy to think about the fact that it's 274. <laughs> it's I'm going to be the host today. Chris is actually sailing the Aegean Sea, and I don't know if he was inspired by the most recent Indiana Jones film, if that's the reason why he's on a cruise in the <laughs> checking out ancient sites or something like that. But I'll be the host today. I'm along with my companions. The whole California crew is here. Heather. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Oh my gosh, I blanked out, my friend. <laughs> His name is not host. <laughs> Stanley. Uh, and the other host, Andrew. Yeah, Andrew, just, my <laughs> God. I am tra- I am ruining okay, this thing. What a see, joke. You know, these UC over. professors did. You see, pro- no, dude, we're keeping it. He's no, I blanked out and looked, and it says host, and I'm just like, and we're here with the, oh my, sh- oh gosh, Andrew, I dude, I do that all the time. I do it like I'm worse. I guarantee I'm worse than you. With this names. is what happens I'm, when you just if you're you know if you're listening to this, this is what happens when you just read what's in front of you. Use yes. your brain. You know you're supposed Fill to read between the, the lines. Boy, yeah. oh boy, I can't tell. Dude, I I joke, but I I lose my mind with names every day of my life. I'm terrible. <laughs> so like, I, this, I deserve this. Holy gosh, yeah. Andrew Kinkella, apologies about that. Blink and uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll deal with this. Somehow. This is the what number one step of how a CRM project can go wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. don't remember the names of the people <laughs> you're in the field with. <laughs> you don't need to know everyone's background, but you should know their name. Yeah. yeah. yeah Archaeologist our- number one. That's Archaeologist right. number two. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh man. Uh, our our topic today is how do archaeology <clears throat> projects go wrong, right? And so I had a, an original idea, but now my idea has changed after an exercise I did with my students this last week. I found it really interesting, probably more than probably any other exercise I've done with students before. We had a smoke day, so I couldn't actually go out and do the thing that I had planned. So rather, I pivoted and had an in-class exercise where I divided up my class into three different roles and had them take on different personas that are connected to positions in cultural resources companies. And so we had quite a while. We had three hours. It was a lab class that we were supposed to be outside. And because of the smoke, we couldn't be outside. So I had plenty of time for folks to work through this thing. And I split the class up into some common positions at CRM companies. So a third of the class took on the position of principal investigator. And the the whole idea was that they were going to plan a a short one-day survey and that they would have to travel from Southern California all the way to Northern California. And and they, you know, the the plan was to have one day out in the field and then one travel day back. And that the the PIs were making these arrangements for one crew chief and four field techs. And so They weren't digging. They were just going up there and they knew that there was possibly the remains of a farmstead, not a big site, but it was within a large parcel. Right. So the idea was they're going to drive from Southern California one day, stay in a hotel, go to the project area, do the survey, record the site. There's five people. They're all skilled. So they were were told that, you know, their their uh, crew chief has a master's and a couple years of experience and their field techs had a year or two experience. and They'd done field school and they had some, you know, um, time and cultural resources. And so it was like, you know, you were going to have your pretty journeyman, you know, intermediate level crew that was going to be out there doing this. And we had plenty of information, right? So I told them that it was a time and materials contract. They just had to figure out how much it was going to cost to get the people up there and keep them there. And then, you know, that they would just submit that budget to the client, right? The client just wanted to get it done. So then I had a third of the class split up into crew chiefs and I told them their position was to manage the project, get it done. You know, they were, they were going to be told how many hours they had to do it, 
and how many folks they had working with them. And that was just what was going to happen. It was going to be a day up from Southern California, Northern California, do the survey and then back, right? And they'd have four people that would be working with them. And they got a map of the project area too. So it, it, interestingly, this is a space that we already had, I had already gone with students before. It's in a you know regional park. And so I just you know didn't show them where existing sites were, but just had a polygon on a Google Earth thing that they could you know, measure out transects and set it up. And, and there's roads in there so they could decide how they're going to get access to the area. And I told them all about that. And then I told them they had to set up the lodging and, you know, get their crew ready. And then the, the final third were the, were the field techs. And so they were supposed to have all the concerns of a field tech. And I told them that they're, you know, working their way up in cultural resources. They've been doing it a year or so. And they've done several projects and that they were going to be the ones who would be recording the site, walking the transects, identifying artifacts and all those kind of things. So for the first 10 minutes or so, the, the groups all started to work forward, right? So the field techs are kind of like, where is this place? They're looking on the map and they're kind of like, you know, where are we going to stay at? Or is the motel going to have breakfast? Like, do we have to drive our own cars? Are we going to get gas money? You know, how's this whole thing working? What time are we leaving? How many hours are we out there, right? So they're thinking those kind of questions. I was telling them, write a list of those things that you want to know so that you can ask your crew chiefs. They're the ones who are figuring that out. The crew chiefs want to know how much money they have to work with so they can make these decisions, right? And so they're trying to figure those kind of things out too. How are they going to get people there? Do they have to rent a truck? You know, where are they going to stay at? They're, they're working through those kind of things along with how huge is this area? How many hours will it take? Like, you know, is this way out there? Are there any other concerns? Can I learn more about the project? So they've got all these questions and the principal investigators are thinking they start initially adding it up and calculating for all the people to come from Southern California up here. And then they start realizing, you know what, if we just hired local people, we wouldn't have to pay for a truck or a per diem or motel or anything. So we're just going to find people on the internet that are archeologists and just have them work the project. And we're not going to you know, hire anyone from the company. And it'll save us thousands of dollars. So <laughs> these are uh, these are undergrads who haven't done cultural resources before. But interestingly, you can see their thought patterns are already the same things that constantly are going on in CRM folks' minds, right? Okay, so so after a few minutes, I go, well, everybody's got these questions and concerns. So let's let go ahead. Let's just you know ask each other. And so the field techs are saying, are we going to have? Per diem, do we get mini fridges? Like, do I have to drive my own car? How's this whole thing going to work out? And the crew chiefs are saying, okay, well, I'll ask the supervisor, but yeah, you know, seriously, do, are we going to get per diem? What's going on? And the people who are the principal investigators are like, yeah, you know, we calculated that we just wouldn't have any of you work here. We're just going to hire project hires from the area and that's it. So, yeah. So, so then the crew chiefs are looking like, well, do I have a job? I mean, what's going on? The, the, Field techs are already moving on. Okay, sweet. I'm just going to apply somewhere else. Project's over. Class is over. No. So then, so then I, I would go, I, I had to change the rules and say, well, you have to include people from your company. Otherwise, you won't have a company. And even though you can get contracts and sub I didn't tell them this, but I was like, even though you can just totally get contracts and then take a few thousand dollars and subcontract it out to a real company for this exercise, also so the class lasts more than 40 minutes, I want you to assume that you're going to employ your own actual employees and have them do the project. <laughs> so once I said that, then the plans went back to what they were doing before. They start making the calculations of how much it's going to cost. Then folks move forward. They say, oh, you're going to get paid. The field techs were going to get paid $25 an hour. The crew chief was going to get paid $35 an hour. Now, of course, these are folks coming from Southern California. People across the country are listening to this like, oh, my God, you know, don't spit your coffee out. This is Southern California. I don't know what true salaries are in Southern California, but I think that $25 an hour is probably a, on the low end of an entry level, and it would still not be easy to survive in Southern California. And I know that, you know, mm -hmm. the rate for the, the... It could be lower than that, Bill. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, 25 is somebody who has some experience. What about the, yeah. Although that's starting what about to the crew chief? It all, de it all depends. I mean, what kind of crew chief do you need? You have all different levels of crew chief. So sometimes your crew chief, and you know what? Sometimes if that crew chief is, has worked for the company, and I'm, again, please don't everybody start writing nasty letters. <laughs> I'm not saying that this is the right thing. I'm just telling you that yeah. if the crew chief is a full-time employee with the company 
you know, they get an opportunity for a raise once a year, typically. Yeah. And so their amount, I mean, you see it all the time. It happens in every business. People that come in, the newest hires are usually many times making more money yeah. than the people that have been there a long time because they negotiated. They had an opportunity to yeah. negotiate their their pay. So, you know, field directors can be all over the place. And I have a few, I'm going to let you finish because yeah. I have a few things like, I'm sure there are companies that handle it this way. I don't handle projects this way, but uh, I think it is important for your students to understand that it can go this way. But I would also like to provide an alternative. Yeah. So yeah. they don't think that all CRM companies or all environmental companies work this way. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, <laughs> I, yes. So, I mean, a little bit of foreshadowing folks will turn into the, yes. you know, all the worst trope as we still shall soon see. Yes. So I'm glad to know that the price ranges aren't so incredible that, you know, I, I, once again, like I said, I was putting this thing together after my actual day was canceled. I needed to figure something out. Right. So I think you did a pretty good okay, job. Yeah. 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 No, All right. This, this was the figure out. This, this, was my, this was the pivot. This was my yeah. backup. That's exercise. a good mid range. Yeah. yeah. Good mid range. Yeah. What you're okay. Saying. Yeah. Okay. So folks yeah. go back to, in, in act one, they go back to calculating. So then I, I throw a curveball in there for all three groups. So for the, the PIs, I say, after you've made the calculations and your crew chief has made the hotel reservations and stuff is, you know, you know, getting ready to go the day before the client calls and says, Hey, I got five more acres that's nearby. Can you please survey that too? When you've already got folks up there, you know, it, they, they give no map. They give no other information besides, I got five acres also I want you to survey. Once you're done with the big parcel, then go to this other smaller parcel. So the the PI start making the calculations of like, well, dope, this is only a five acre area. And, you know, we've already got a whole team up there. Let's just double the whole damn thing and make it be another day out there in the field, right? So they set to work under those parameters. I go to the crew chiefs and I tell them, all right, your curveball is there's someone who was just hired about three months ago. They just finished their PhD at an Ivy League school and they're a field tech on your crew. But the whole time they've ever been there for three weeks, they've just complained about everything. They've been complaining about the supervisors. They've been complaining about the company, about the survey methods, about how things are just not like what they learned in their PhD and how everyone's wrong. And they don't want to listen to anyone who doesn't have a PhD which the, the crew chief doesn't have a PhD and has to take this person out there. And to make matters worse, they're wrong on every measurement. They don't know how to use a compass. They, you know, never figure out any artifact identification. They just think that they're, you know, a prima donna that's the best in the world and that everyone else is beneath them. And the, and the meeting before they go, the person is complaining about this project also and lets it go that they're pretty depressed that they're getting paid $38 an hour, even though they have a PhD which is more than everyone else on the crew. And they're sitting there along with the other crew and they're the ones complaining about how they get paid so little, even though they have a PhD. Right. And then I tell the crew chief, you have to take this person out with you and you're responsible for getting the project done. No matter how their behavior is out there, they're out there with you. They're part of the crew. So then I go to the text and I tell them the same thing. I go, this person's here. They've only been here three weeks or three months. You've been here a year. And they they're getting paid thirty eight dollars an hour, and they complain about everything. And you got to carry them through every project. Oh, and by the way, every mistake they make, you have to fix. You need to fix all their mistakes to get this project done because you're the you're the techs, and you need to get it done. So then I stand back and watch the whole thing go. After that, so they don't all know each other's curveballs. The the PIs just set to work like yeah, double the money for less work. Yes, yes, yes. They start making double calculations on everything because they're like, sweet, a whole other day. That that is going to make us like ten thousand more dollars. Okay, so then the the crew chiefs. This I, it was amazing the response because in my experience the response is not the same. They actually figured out that they needed to make some community guidelines for being on a crew because and they they tell the PIs that they've noticed some kind of bad morale among the people and they think that if they can make several guidelines that include not slandering the company not complaining, trying to actually improve yourself, listening and learning to other people on the crew, that this will improve the morale. And so they put this piece of paper together and then they go and talk to the text and go, look, we know this guy's a problem, but we want you, here's the thing, we want you all to sign this thing. And the PIs are like, yeah, sweet, as long as you get the project done, okay, cool. 
go ahead. But the minute they complain, that's grounds for a complaint. And then they can start moving towards dismissing that person or they'll shut up and they'll actually get better. So I was like, man, that's amazing. I can't believe they thought of that. The techs were like, yeah, you know what? We're out of here. We quit. <laughs> so we're not going out. We want, we want $40 an hour. Right. We're not going out with that person. We're not fixing anything, any problems. And if we don't get what we want, then you know we're not getting benefits anyway. We're, we're temp hires. We're out of here. We're just going to another company. I don't want to work with that guy. So then I was like, so crew chiefs, how are you going to get your crew to work? Is, is it going to just be you and the PhD that finishes the thing? Because it's not really possible for you to do it in two days. If it's just two of you, what are you going to do? So then they start talking about like, well, what do you really want? They're like, we don't want this person on the crew, man. We don't want this going on. We want a hotel. We want per diem. We want mini fridges. We want all this. And they're like, okay, let me see what I can do about that. So then after the whole thing starts degenerating and the crew chiefs decide, and some of the crew chiefs were actually super mad too. And they were like, you know what? I don't want to work here anymore. We need to get that person out of here. Like, I don't want to work for this company. So I let it go for about five or 10 minutes. And then I say, okay, now what's going on here? And the crew chiefs are like, or the PIs are saying, hey, guess what? There's a whole other parcel. We're going to make more money, but you guys have to stay out for another day. Is that cool? The crew chiefs are like, yeah, everything's collapsing, man. Uh, we better figure this out. And then the techs are saying, we want way more money or we're out of here. So the PIs are like, well, what's the problem? And they go, this person right here, they're a problem. They don't, they don't work well. So the PIs are like, oh, that's the problem. Okay, well, then they're not coming with you. They're fired. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, whoa, that was fast. Like, yeah, that yeah. person's a problem. Okay, they're just off the crew. They're out of here. If they're causing problems and crying about the wages, they're out of here. How about we give you a $5 raise text and we'll make sure the motel's in a good place and next to a bunch of food right. options and everything else. Is that cool? Right. Well, $5 raise. Okay, cool. So then they also talk to the crew chiefs and they go, look, thanks for bringing this to our attention. We really value you. Thank you for putting those community guidelines together. Hey, we're going to give you a $5 raise also. So you'll be making more than that PhD was before. And we really want to keep you on the crew, but don't tell the crew that you just got more money. Like, don't tell them that you're making 10 more dollars than them. <laughs> and then everybody goes back to taking care of business. Like they go back to planning it and they feel like they've got everything under control. And then the final curve while I throw them is I go, Hey, so as your guys get in the, the car and start driving to Northern California, the client calls and goes, Hey, over the weekend, I was golfing with this dude who also owns property in the area. And he's got some friends from Louisiana and he said his friends do cultural resources all the time and that that company from Southern California is ripping you off. <laughs> that there's this whole truckload of guys that will drive from Louisiana for $15 an hour, yeah. no overhead, yeah. no nothing. You don't have to pay for a hotel or anything. And they'll take care of your CRM problem for only $15 an hour. And so why would I stay with you guys? Why am I going to pay more money when these dudes over here are going to do it for 15 bucks an hour? And so then everybody's just kind of looking like, yeah, we're not – going to be able to like if these kids won't even work for $30 an hour or 25 then 15 is like you know we're never going to be able to compete with that and the crew chiefs are kind of like yeah so I don't think so and then someone was like you know what you should tell them that if they want to roll their dice on some dude that they just met at the golf course and have kids from $15 an hour drive all the way from Louisiana to San Francisco and survey this thing if they want to risk their entire project's approval so that they can save a few thousand dollars on someone from out of state who doesn't know what the hell they're doing, then we're not going to compete on that level. That's not what we're doing. And I was like, well, class is over. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> put it, put the ball back in their court, right? Like, yeah, sure. Yeah. We're not going to try to go down to $15 an hour. We can't do it. We won't, we'll go out of business. Like we're just not going to do it. Oh, this whole thing. That is genius, dude. I guess I have to take a break. <laughs> it was their responses. That, they're yeah. the ones who made it happen. No, that's, that's, the, that's what's great. But I guess when we return, more on this genius Lord of the Flies moment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're back with the second act, talking about how archaeology projects go wrong. I mean, I think... I, there, I, I was just astounded by the responses because these are folks, this class is an undergrad class. The folks, you know, they didn't even really know what CRM was in August. And by the end of September, yeah. they're already acting and showing a lot of the different characteristics that we see in a lot of companies. But I think Heather was going to help us out because, mm -hmm. of course, you know, this is like simulation in class. And uh, Heather can actually give us more insight on how this unfolds in the real world. Well, I think, first of all, your student's response is 
an indicator of how well the class is going, which yeah. pat on, on Bill's back. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're learning a lot, obviously. So, you know, there's there's a few things that I think, like I kind of interjected early on where, you know, there's some things that are not totally realistic in every situation, but that certainly could be. I mean, you have these small company people like, you know, recently I've had somebody reach out and was asking about starting a CRM company. They haven't even worked in CRM yet. And, you know, that's I, I think if anybody's considering doing that, you really do need to work in the business first because you have no idea like you you're really going to shoot yourself in the foot. So there are some things here that could definitely go in that direction if the principal invest investigators are not that savvy on a business end and have not been in CRM for a while. So I, I definitely think that those are potentials. But a few things that just popped out of my head because I was like, oh my gosh, I got to start writing these things down because I'm forgetting them. But one is the thing is that before you're going in the field, you're writing a proposal. I just want people to understand that uh, unless, you know, of course there's CRM companies that don't know what they're doing, but all this is figured out prior to going out in the field. And generally it's figured out by the principal investigator or the PM. I shouldn't even say pr principal investigator because principal investigator can be a PM, can be a project manager with management skills, and but they could also just be the person who is secretary of interior qualified, who's able to create a research design, a work plan. They're not looking at the business side. They're just making sure that the work is done at, a standards or above level. Yeah. So, you know, the principal, and I just want to make sure people understand that just because you have a principal investigator does not mean that, that person is a PM. Sometimes you have another lab level yeah. that's a PM. And sometimes in some companies, it's not even an archaeologist who's the PM. <laughs> it's another analyst of some sort, right? Uh, maybe a NEPA analyst or a CEQA in California, CEQA analyst, who is the PM. But generally, the archaeologist really should be writing the proposals and it should be somebody who has some business sense. Yeah. And I, I also had a question about the name of calling them crew chiefs, right? Because yeah. field director felt more natural, but then like I just kind of reverted back, right? So like, do we call them crew chiefs anymore? Or is it just field director? Okay. No, 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 we do. Got it. I, I, I think it just depends on the company and how, or, or like in our company, it just depends on who you're talking to. Some people call them field directors. Some people call them crew chiefs. Okay. I, I don't think that it really matters. And sometimes if you have a really large project, you can have a field director and then you can have crew chiefs because you have yeah. multiple okay. crews on one project. So now you have more stratification. And, okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I knew I knew about the project director thing, and I didn't know if it should be the difference between owner or principal investigator. Like, I didn't know. It could be uh, both. Okay, cool. Yeah, because a smaller CRM company, it, your owner is your PM many times, right? They're the ones that are making the managerial position uh, decisions and money decisions because they know bottom line. So the overhead is important, and this is something I know I've talked at nauseum on other shows about, but the overhead of a company is really important to the finances and and creating a work plan that can work as far as from a f fiscally it depends not all companies are the same some companies have higher overhead than others and so they're able to charge less or some companies their hands are tied they have to charge more but why would they charge more and why would the client go with somebody who charges more because that person let's say that that larger company is a one stop shop it saves the client money and time. They don't have to go around and find an archaeologist, find a biologist, find this person. They just hire a environmental company and they take care of all technical scopes. Or sometimes a project is an environmental and you're doing an environmental document and a maybe this is the case in this that you're talking about, a resource is found and now you have to send a crew out. So generally it's done by the same company if they have a cultural practice that is involved with the project to begin with. So those are some things that I was thinking about is that hopefully you work for a company where all these things are already answered and a field director crew chief is not having to answer these basic budgetary questions. However, it does happen that the crew chief is in charge of making sure that everybody has hotels and everything. The other th thing that I had is this concept of equal pay. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it because that could be a whole other 
show. But a crew chief should get paid more than the techs. They just should. If you're out on that project and you're all doing the same thing, everybody's walking, everybody's digging, everybody. Yes, everybody's doing from just a cursory look is doing the same thing. But the crew chief has a completely different level of responsibility than the techs do. The techs show up and they dig and they walk and they record and that's it. The chief then has to take all that information. If something goes wrong, they have the skill set to be able to switch the strategy, you know, your work plan. If something comes up that you weren't expecting, these are all things that you're paying for the skill set of that individual to be able to handle something that comes along so that your project doesn't get too far, too squirrely. So the concept that a tech should be making the same as a, as a crew chief is to me, not valid. Right. And, I think that's, yeah. Yeah. And then that seems bad. So the yeah. PhD guy, geez. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. No, that's, that's so, a critical piece of this entire yeah, exercise, that's, right? That's critical. And, but this, that's everything I'm saying is not to say this does, this stuff does not happen. It does happen. Oh yeah. yeah no, no, I just want to make sure that people know, because I, I, it makes me sad when people come in. I think this is important for students to have this critical mindset and to understand, but they can't go in thinking that every company is there to screw them. Cause yeah. they, first of right. all, their career is going to go awry if they do that yeah. <laughs> and they're going to be miserable people. But the PhD, I could see some reasons why I would do this why would have a PhD come out in the field? Let's say they just started and we want them as a research archaeologist. So what we're doing is we want to have them do the ethnography, the background sections in reports, but we still want them to have an experience in the field and really understand and have respect for. So the, the purpose could could be a good purpose. Like as a PI, I'm like, you know what? It's an opportunity for this guy to really understand what it really is like to get this stuff done. So they have a respect for the crews out in the field. They understand this. We do this with health and safety officers. We do this with non-archaeologists who are PMs, environmental analysts, to get them to understand how hard it is in the field. So they have a respect for our field techs and our crew chiefs. So I could see a good reason why you would put a PhD out there. But if the guy already has an attitude, that's like, unfortunate. Unless, unless you're trying to knock his ego down a little bit, his or her ego yeah. down a little bit, and that's the purpose of putting him out there. But you have to let your crew chief know that. So I don't think yeah. it happens all that often. But if it sometimes there is a good reason to put a yeah. PhD guy. Yeah, out no, there. this this happens a lot is yeah. all there really yeah. is to it. Because uh, um, yeah, I think it happens a lot more than folks want to admit because I think a lot of companies do want that archaeologist to be a research archaeologist or to be, yeah. you know, a project manager or, you know, rise up higher. And so they're rolling the dice on someone who has zero experience outside of their PhD and, you know, they want them to learn how to do field work. They want them to get to the point where they can supervise crews and they want them to be there for a long time. Like they're investing for like, you know, the, the long term. And I think a lot of times people come out and they've been fed a lot of stories about how tenure tracks, the only dream. Like if you don't get tenure track, you're a loser, like all these problems they've internalized and how they've, you know, they went into a PhD a lot of times with the explicit goal. I'm going to be a professor and this is what I'm going to do. And who cares about the odds? It'll all work Mm -hmm. out for me. But then when they need to feed themselves, they go to cultural resources. And so they do have a chip on their shoulder a lot of times where they show up and they've got a PhD. And that's why I added the Ivy League piece in there too in California, right? Because California doesn't really have Ivy League schools. So you're talking about someone who is totally used to being in that really privileged environment and they show up in Southern California and now they're doing a cultural resources job and they're not even actually in charge of it. They're actually one of the crew and it's a huge ego blow and not everybody knows how to handle that. Right. It's a similar circumstance as I have a PhD and I'm not making any money. So I'm, I have to go to Starbucks. And I have to start working at Starbucks. I'm going to walk in and have an attitude that I have a PhD. Therefore you have to treat me differently than all the other Starbucks employees. I mean, it really is similar because it's so far different. Yeah. Just because you're an archaeologist and everybody else is an archaeologist doesn't mean your skill set's the same. It's not the same. Yeah. And if you were trying to get a tenure track, 
your dissertation, your graduate research, all of that is not aimed towards CRM archaeology. It's aimed towards academic archaeology. So it's like apples and oranges. Yeah, and that's, it's so unfortunate. It shouldn't yeah. be that way. But yeah. I, I do have to say that, you know, that first segment, Bill, that was like the Andrew Kinkala life story. Like I've experienced <laughs> all of that. You know, like a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah I also kind of, have too. Yeah, that whole kind of Kobayashi Maru, you know, like the no win scenario, the sort of distri- the slow destruction of the CRM crew, the factionalization, like all that stuff. I hope that every student in CRM <laughs> listens to this and and takes that first, takes your setup, you know, super seriously. Yeah. And kind of like Heather was saying, I'm not here to say that happens every time. That that was not my experience every time, but I definitely experienced everything that Bill brought up I to, to a hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Each, yes. Yeah. each of those, I know those people, like yeah. I know them, you know? So yeah. I just want everybody to know that. I mean, I trained them close. in the case I, of the, the PhDs who, who come in with a chip on their, I'm the yeah. one who trained them right. and kept yeah. them from getting fired. Because yep. their success depended on me putting diapers on my oh, kid. I know. And I could not, I couldn't let one person's chip on their shoulder derail yeah. this entire thing. Yes. Yeah. And so I had to find a way to get the text to work. And also for this person who knows nothing to actually just learn stuff so that yeah. we could get the job done. Yeah. I had that a person. PhD. Geez. I mean, I, I, that guy's got it. That's an attitude problem. That's a personality problem that isn't just going to rear its ugly head in the field. It's going to rear its ugly head in right. every aspect of CRM. If, yeah. if a company keeps that guy, not to say that they don't. They but do well, that yeah. But I mean, it was amazingly how swift, how the students were like, okay, that's the problem. And all I got to do yeah. is just get rid of them. Sweet. Yeah. And then I was yeah. like, well, I if you get rid them. of them, then you're down one person. They're like, we don't care. We, we don't care. Four can do the yes. job. Uh, you know, it might take longer. It might be yes. more difficult, but if by getting rid of this person, they don't like, saves the project we're they're gone and so i think that's a lot of other phds they get in there and they can't hang and then all of a sudden they're not working there anymore they've separated they've left they've gone to another place yeah well it could be a company that's toxic or it could be the fact that you think that you're you know bigger and better than you are yeah. and you couldn't hang in crm and you're, and you're a hand you're a cancer you've created yeah. a cancer for your, i mean for your own self right yeah. because if that okay so if that person had walked in with a phd and had been willing to learn and listen for all the, this person has been here two years and done a million projects, right? Those other right. techs, they know how to find new jobs. They know how to scramble. They know how to survive in hotel rooms. Like if they had really opened their eyes and ears and listened and paid attention and took advice, they would have ended up being at the very top of the heap with a bunch of experience, with a bunch of people who knew what they were doing because yeah. they have a PhD, right? They're willing to learn. There's no upper limit on a PhD in archaeology, right? So it, once you'd learned and once you'd become a you know good citizen and a good colleague, then you're like a total asset, right? Then you can go to bat for the crew. Then you can, you know, help everyone else out when they promote you to higher levels. But if you show up with a chip on your shoulder and think yeah. it's beneath you, even though you're getting paid more money than everybody else, like, yeah, that's not good. You know what, though? No. That happens at every level. It happens with MAs. Well, yeah, I can see that happening. It yeah. happens with seasoned techs. With BAs, I mean, a jerk is a jerk. Yeah, yeah. an egotist <laughs> is an egotist. You are you are right and about that. <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's unfortunately not uncommon. And yeah. uh, with, oh, with that double negative, we'll see you guys on the flip yeah. side. <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome back. We're in the third segment of our conversation about how field projects go wrong in the field, based on a a class exercise that. You know, I think it I think it went quite well. I, I appreciate Heather giving us a lot of clarity because they put the assignment together in a few hours and it actually turned out, you know, better than a lot of other things that I've spent days and days doing. Is, isn't yeah. that the truth, though, so much on that? I mean, it's just it, it just <laughs> genius I comes. It, I, yeah. I, if only I could recreate this for the other, you know, 16 weeks, I'd be. Yeah gold that happens in my world too though sometimes there's that, under pressure yeah there's yeah. that the energy part. there you yeah. know like i think that's so great you know I, and i will say you know back to that first segment i mean i had my mic turned off a lot just because i was laughing because it was it was hitting <laughs> so close to home you know i'm like i can't uh, what can i say this is this is so close the other thing i would say is in terms of projects that go south like that in my personal experience, I've been on projects, I've gotten hired later where I could feel that that stuff already happened. You know what I mean? Like you get hired on the project and you can tell an atom bomb went off like 
two weeks prior because your pay is good, where you're staying is good. It, it seems almost too good to be true. And then once you're on the project, they're like, oh, yeah, you should have been here two weeks ago. You're like, oh. So the setup that Bill has given to his students, there, there can be that aftermath of, of things can get better. So that was just an experience I had. And I know that, uh, Bill, you wanted to bring up what some of the field techs in the exercise said. Yeah, because, you know, the exercise was it it was also there was points involved, too. Right. So Mm -hmm. like when there's when it's a graded assignment every week in the lab thing, there's some kind of assignment and it's always worth some points. So folks were not just like there was incentive to not just turn on TikTok and just sit there. right? Right. So they actually this was their assignment for that day. Uh, and also a lot of people were really interested in it because this is folks that want to do archaeology. They're going to graduate and they're thinking about going into archaeology. And this is sadly, yet again, one of the first classes that's ever really talked about cultural resources. So they're, this is their first real time that anyone centered that as a topic of you know learning. And so they're they're realizing, wow, this could be a real career. But wow, it's it's you know it's like every other career. It's not going to just fall into my lap. It's it's complicated. And so the PIs were spent, most of their time was spent doing the calculations for the budget, right? So they were going to send this on to the, the client. The crew chiefs, most of their time was spent figuring out how the heck this is even going to work. And then when they throw in the extra five acres, they're kind of like, well, we don't even know what to expect with that. Like, we can only plan for this other part, but this additional thing, we have no map, no idea where it's at. Like, I don't even know you know, what to do. So they really were focused on other kind of like uh, mechanical issues, but the, the field techs, because they were, you know, kind of out of the decision-making loop, their, their questions had a lot to do with like their work conditions. And so when I was talking to them as they were working through, once they realized that they were going to get whatever pay rate and they agreed to do the job and stuff, uh, they had a lot of questions about like uh, health and safety out in the field for the first time someone had ever really asked like do we do background checks on the people who are working with us in the field and uh i didn't really have a response to that it's been a long time since i worked in crm as a you know full-time job so yeah in academia there's total background checks to figure out and i i took a training that was talking about the level of checks that we do for professors that are coming in and so yeah at a certain point when we're getting ready to offer a job to a professor there is an evaluation from your previous employer, they look into your, you know, other, your conduct and stuff. And so those kind of things about harassment, discrimination and stuff that it's more likely to find that for a professor than it is for a cultural resources. And I was kind of like, yeah, they, we don't really do background checks. And then they had a lot of questions about like, you know, health and safety regarding them working with people they've never worked with. Like, how do they know they're going to be safe in the field with other people? And I'm kind of like, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any response. I've worked on crews before where I was the only one who didn't have a handgun. And I was like, man, that's against the rules and all this other stuff. I'm the only one out here that doesn't have one. And and that's been my thing. How do I know if those folks are going to use them or like what's going on? Right. So that's like a whole, I never really thought about that kind of stuff. Not necessarily that gun owners are going to just start, you know, shooting wild like Yosemite Sam, but you never know if the thing could discharge in the truck or like if they're safe around it, like you never really know. Same thing with knives. You never really know if someone's safe with a knife or a machete or something like that. These are tools that we've had before. I never really thought about whether, you know, someone was going to do something with that. But the other thing they were had questions about, like, you know, benefits in healthcare. And I was kind of like at the health, at the field tech level, if you're working, if you're a permanent hire for the company, that's your best chance to have health care. But if you get hurt out there and, you know, you you're probably on your own for insurance. Most techs are on their own for insurance. And so the students are kind of like, huh, you know, like you can see their wheels already turning like, well, then I got to get to the crew chief level. That's all I got to do so I can get benefits and higher wages and like all this other stuff. But, you know, that that they had a lot of questions and we were I, I didn't have answers. Maybe folks here, you have answers on background checks or safety or or any of those other things. Yeah, I'll say, of course, I can only speak from my own experience. I'm sure that there are plenty of companies that, that don't. I would think in this day and age, I would hope just to protect themselves, that they would do some kind of level of a background check. When we hire people, we do a background check. I don't, you know, it's a really good question. I don't know if we do it for as needed. I think we do. But um, I think it's like a cursory one for full time. I think it's more robust. That's, I believe, the case. You know, background checks are expensive. It depends on how 
companies look at as needed. If they're just always rotating as needed all the time, as needs, meaning you're just hiring people for one project or they're on call for you or whatever. Maybe they don't do a thorough background check every time. I would hope they do. But with that said, as far as getting hurt on the job, if you get hurt on the job, that is workers' compensation. You should be cared for in that way. If the injury is based on something that happens in the field, but again, that's something that you need to report. So if you get hurt in the field, you have to let people know that. We actually were just discussing recently our health and safety division. We were discussing within our you know project leaders. We we're talking about how you know you have some of these injuries that happen over the period of someone's career: bad backs, bad knees, things like that. Where where does it? At, at, who's responsible for it? If you or an as-needed employee, you know, that's a little trickier. But now that's where our health and safety department is saying, listen, you need to really stress to those that are in, in the field that if you are not feeling well, we would rather catch this now before you go out in the field and hurt yourself more so. And is it because they care about the employees? Yes, it's also from a practical perspective, because if you send people out that are already not feeling well and you send them out, now the liability is even greater for the company because now something actually does happen while they're in the field. So if let's say, you know, they they kind of twist their ankle dancing the night before and they come in because they need the money or they're coming in because they don't want to be that one person that calls in the morning of and says, I'm not feeling well. And now that you're short a person on the team, but they push through and say they're going to go anyway. And then they end up like totally twisting their ankle and ripping, you know, ligaments or whatever. That is a liability. You're looking at it from a short sighted perspective of just pushing through, which actually many times can uh, just propagate injuries that cost the company even more. So for as needed, typically you don't have the full benefits just like any, most companies, you're not going to go in and work for a company for a week and get full benefits. It doesn't work that way. I mean, you have to kind of, it takes a while just to, to get benefits going. The full-time employees, you should be getting benefits. Yes. I mean, I can't imagine a company these days not giving benefits to a full-time employee. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, to, I, I have not had, <laughs> I have not worked for an employer. I, I'm not even going to, comment on my current employer but i've never worked for an employer that was like yeah we need to take care of the health of the field crew or any of our employees because they're like uh, you know a valuable asset it's only been we have health and safety regs so that you don't sue us when you get cancer from breathing in mm. you know uh chemicals from the site that we're having you dig or you know where we've decided not to sift sediments that have arsenic in them not because we don't want to find the artifacts, but because we think you might get sick after that whole thing happened. So I, I haven't been in a situation where they super cared about the health and safety. I mean, stuff like uh, wilderness first aid and, and CPR and stuff. A lot of times I had to pay for that myself and I had to go and find those yeah. classes and do that stuff myself. Right. And so like when it comes to some of these health and safety things, the crew chief plays like an important role because I've only worked for companies where it was just like end on budget you know, don't go over or they were really small and they were friendly and everything, but they just didn't really have those kind of health and safety mechanisms. But the bigger corporate companies, they did not care about our health and safety. They just mm -hmm. didn't want us to get hurt at work, that it could directly be connected to them. Yeah, I, I actually, you know, it's funny because as you were talking, I was thinking to myself for me, because I've worked for smaller companies. I've worked for larger companies. I work for a medium size company right now. And I would say I feel more protected with a larger, medium-sized company than a small company. Not because the small companies like screw the workers, but because they're not savvy enough. They don't have a dedicated team that is putting together trainings. We have a, I mean, it's, yeah. we have, I would say probably a hundred trainings, different types of trainings that during the year, emails are sent out to everybody that works for us and saying, we need you to take this training. The, right now, it's like a heat-related training or valley fever training. We have all these separate trainings based on where people are working that we require that they take them. And 
Now, is it because they care? I do, they're humans. Yes. I mean, yeah. you don't have robots working in human resources as much as I think some people think there are robot, robots. Yeah. But these are human beings. They do care about people. I've worked with many different safety officers. They really do care. And that's their whole job is to make sure that people are safe. But from a practical perspective, you're absolutely right. They're making sure they limit the liability of the company. Well, that's a good thing. That's a good thing because if a health and safety officer is looking at it and saying, wait a minute, I want to make sure that we don't have people getting injured in the field because if they get injured in the field, it's going to be on us to pay all the workers comp and all the, and our safety rating goes down. All these things, they're trying to prevent those things. Those are good things. Those laws are there to protect and health and safety managers are there to make sure that they're followed so that the company is protected. That's a good thing. It's not just an emotional thing. It's an emotional thing. There's no regulations. So I think that honestly, a larger company is going to have their act together more so than a smaller company. I'm sure there are small companies out there that really do know. And you know what? There's small companies that may care, but they may not even have the tools or know how to protect their employees. Yeah, I think that I think that was my experience at the smaller companies that they just, they did care about us and they didn't want us to get hurt and they did everything they could to keep us safe, but they didn't really have like safety officers and stuff. So it wasn't, you know, it was kind of up to folks and they were down if you wanted to get the training with helping you get it and they would pay all the money for all that stuff, but they just really didn't, there wasn't a comprehensive plan. Sure. Whereas other companies, man, I'm telling you the ones that were like, I don't know how big Dudek is, but. I've been at companies that seriously would tell techs, you know, it's, it's less, it's less expensive for me to get more shovels than it is for me to get you right. Like, you know, you're as, you're as disposable as a shovel. You're just the tool I use to dig my site. Like yeah, literally we don't, tell, we don't literally tell that people way. that, you know, yeah. what are you complaining about? Cause within, you know, one yeah. email I can get someone to replace you. So just mm-hmm. go ahead and go. And I mean, I've, I've, I've seen it happen in the field. I've heard it happen before too. And so yeah, I think that is a, it's an, ignorant perspective and i it's stupid it's not practical it's not right on a moral level but it's also not practical because if you do that you're pushing people and next thing you know you're going to have all these injuries in the field they're going to cost the company money and cost the company opportunities for large projects because when their safety rating goes down because they have I mean, all these go on the record. Yeah, and well, they don't all go on the record. But all I'm saying is, like, you'll end up in the situation where we're at today where you can't find anyone to be an archaeologist because yeah. there's no, like, they haven't taken care of people's careers or livelihood. And, and mm-hmm. every, you know, I get these emails, like, be part of my panel about, you know, helping me figure right. out, you know, how to, how to, you know, can you train more people in university to help them go into archaeology? Because I, I can't find people and I'm shaking my head like, Dude, if I do that and they go and work because I already know your company, you're going to just grind them down and flame them out and treat them like trash and they're going to move on and do something else. Like, so I already know that's the pathway for seriously more than half of people. I've worked for those companies. I quit those companies, right? (laughs) That's how I got to where I'm at because I worked at those companies and left them. Yet again, Bill, you and I have the same origin story. I had that. I've had that exact same experience and that stuff lasts, you know, like my experiences, my negative experiences with certain CRM firms, even 20 years ago, I'm like, they're on my blacklist even today. Like with my yeah. students, I'm like, nah, I wouldn't work over there, you know? Yes. And, and so that stuff lasts basically forever. And people who get a little bit of power, like Bill or I in the academic world, we can really hurt them ultimately. And they deserve right. it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. You know, it's yeah there well, are the, companies. I've seen companies. I've, I've heard and I've experienced it back when I was not in a full-time position. Yeah. I've definitely. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. It absolutely happens. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I do think that just because I think overall you're safer at a medium or at least a company that has a dedicated health and safety department because that's their entire job, especially now right. there's degrees on health and safety and they're being taught the right things. It's not just, you know, keep the nose clean of the company. Yeah. But I, I do think that we should do a podcast just on how do people starting in, in the CM world or even midway through, how do they vet a company? How do they yeah. look at a company and how do you determine whether or not this company is 
you know, is going to be there to protect you. Yeah, that's I, that's, that's huge. I, I love that idea. That's that's huge. Yeah. And no, well, like, you know, I know we're at, at time, but the field techs came to the question of, well, is there anyone who's really looking out for field techs? And I was just thinking, you all end up looking out for each other through your own networks and everything. And then they were, you know, the class was over, but they're kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is the kind of thing that, you know, unions would be useful for. And I go, yeah, exactly. Because you're skilled workers that they can't accomplish this job without. You need to have these degrees. You need to have this experience. And so you kind of do have some kind of leverage if you could put it together. But we were out of class time. And of course, you know, we're out of time here on the podcast. We've talked about unions before, but they were kind of like, huh, I think that this is the kind of thing a union would help with. And I was like, yeah, well, go ahead and hit it. (laughs) Well, it, it, in the meantime, though, I definitely think, yeah. I mean, I think unions are, if they do happen, are, are far off. They're certainly not going to help the people that are going into the CRM world now. And so they need to have an understanding of what are they going to look at? Uh, what are they looking for when they're working for a company so they don't end up in a bad spot? Yeah. And, you know, crew chiefs really do need to look out for their crew because they're not just a handmaiden to help the people at the top, you know, make money. They really... yes. They they are disp- they have a, a a high level of power because if you think about it, they're the ones who have the power to execute this thing, and they're the make or break. And, and they also have a lot of incentive on having everything go well because they're mm-hmm. you know managers like they're the principal investigators and the project managers of tomorrow. Yeah, and yeah. you know learning those kind of skills, learning that ability to uh, manage people and manage expectations and handle these kind of things that are complicated, like someone who's getting paid more than you, who doesn't want to listen to you and doesn't even like you because you don't have a PhD. Nevertheless, you have things you have to do. So that that's a huge thing and it's a learning lesson and it's a human experience. So I, you know, I get, got to give it up to those folks in the middle and got to give them up to the folks, Mm -hmm. you know, that care, like you're talking about at the top, because there's not enough people at the top that really do care. I, I, I feel like things are kind of changing now since they, they're like running out of Americans to do where, you know, U S citizens to do work. And they're, and they're like, well, it takes many years to train someone. Well, you universities aren't training them. And I'm kind of like, yeah, well, you companies haven't taken care of all the product we've trained for, you know, years <laughs> and years. So, you know, what do we expect? There's, and then there's companies like yours where people probably leave slowly and you hire slowly and you manage your, and there's a few companies that are like that. They really take care of their employees and they mm-hmm. do the right thing. But, you know, I just thought it was it was a good exercise. And I teach an entire graduate course, 16 weeks on cultural resources where they have to fill out an RFP. And we spend a lot of time talking about all this kind of stuff, you know, whole yeah. weeks that we'll talk about health and safety and budgeting and like, you know, project design, design and proposaling and stuff. But this was like a crash course in three hours. <laughs> Pretty yeah. interesting to see how it all unfolded. I think it was all, it's all great. Just, yeah, just great. Right. And I would I would say I just want to, my last comment would be that, you know, however you think about unions or, like I said, they're not here. So take care of each other. Keep your network. When you are going through school, for, for those that are going through school now, or if you're in the beginning of your career, have a notepad and Take down the numbers and the contact and the emails of every pe- every person that you work with, because those that are working in as needed, that's your list. That's your group. Those are your people to help you figure out, is this a good company? Let's say you have an opportunity with the company. Is this a good idea? Are you going to be protected? They're going, do they treat their employees right? Do they treat their as needed right? So just make sure that you keep your network. You are not an uh, island. <laughs> You're not on an island use each other even though let's say you don't have a union you still can be in union with each other all right and with that watch this segue dude thanks to everyone (laughs) and i'm saying this off the top of my head dude you can tell thanks to everyone for joining us this week and thanks also to the listeners for tuning in and we'll see you in the field Bye, Andrew. <laughs> See you next time. Bye. <laughs> oh, thanks for listening, everyone. Andrew, that was impressive. Yeah, good so job. Good. <laughs> Don't read the screen. Oh, wait, Heather, did you say bye? I, I said bye. Yeah, yes. good. Dude, we all, all kind of said bye. It's great. Yeah. 
That's it for another episode of the CRM Archaeology Podcast. Links to some of the items mentioned on the show are in the show notes for this podcast, which can be found at www.archpodnet.com dot com slash crm arc podcast please comment and share anywhere you see the show if you'd like us to answer a question on a future episode email us use the contact form on the website or just email chris at archaeology podcast network.com support the show and the network at arcpodnet.com slash members get some swag and extra content while you're there send us show suggestions and interview suggestions we want this to be a resource for field technicians everywhere and we want to know what you want to know about thanks to everyone for joining me this week thanks also to the listeners for tuning in and we'll see you in the field goodbye This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.